So, and please have a seat, folks. To my immediate left is uh, Mr. Asalam, Feroz Asalam. Uh, Mr. Asalam is a space regulator in Malaysia and the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, responsible for the regulation and implementation of the Malaysian Space Board Act of 2022. This act regulates certain Malaysian space activities for the purposes of safety, registration of space objects, and provides for certain space-related offenses and related matters. Uh, he is also an uh, associate member of the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, and COSPAR, the Committee on Space Research. So, Mr. Eslam, thank you so much for traveling here and for joining us today. Let's have a good conversation. Thank you. To his left is Mr. Kikuchi, Koichi. Mr. Kikuchi is a manager of the International Relations Division of the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. He is also a part-time lecturer at the University of Tokyo Graduate School of Public Policy and a visiting researcher at the University of Tokyo Institute for Future Initiatives and a researcher of uh, Keio University Center of Space Law. Mr. Kikuchi, thank you so much also for traveling with us and, and meeting us today. And to his left, is Mr. Mario Neri. Mr. Neri is a director of Spectrum Strategy and Innovation at Telesat, where he was responsible for directing Telesat's strategy and innovation for the use of spectrum and orbital resources. Mr. Neri is also Telesat's lead on policies related to the sustainable uses of outer space and has assumed various leading roles on satellite issues of the International Telecommu Telecommunication Union, ITU, including chairing Working Group 19, Agenda Item 1.5, and uh, WRC 23, Agenda Item 1.6, related to Earth stations in motion, communicating with GSO and non-GSO satellites in the KA band. Mr. Neri, thank you also for traveling and for b engaging in this conversation. As I say, you're between two lawyers, and now we're going to go for 40 minutes of, well, kind of cross-examine, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> conversation and, uh, you know, um, <laughs> dialogue. I want to talk about this this international framework this this level of international framework and some of the themes that i want to explore are really that kind of that polycentric approach the nature of international fora whether it is copus or itu conference on disarmament the aspects of international space law and space governance and a bit of the norms relating to outer space uh Important first steps for an emerging space state. We're going to ask you, you know, what do you think is important? What do you think are first steps? How does an emerging space state uh, engage in that international governance discussion and participate in that international governance discussion? So my first question is for uh, Mr. Kikuchi. I'd like to know, what has been Japan's posture and approach to international fora? And I say that as a long-standing member, long-standing member of COPUS and the ITU. Japan is. How does Japan coordinate its international approaches to this, this international force? So with that, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Chris Sang, uh, for a kind of introduction and uh, question. Um, now, uh, COPIOS, uh, which was established in uh, 1959, is the forum where uh, space-related uh, tre treaties were drafted. As a recent achievement, uh, space stability mitigation guidelines and uh, uh, guidelines for uh, long-term sustainability for outer uh, space activities, in short, uh, LTS guidelines, were uh, drafted and uh, adapted at uh, COPIOS. I think COPIOS is uh, still functioning as a forum to uh, establish international rules and uh, norms for uh, space activities. Uh, currently, a uh, space resources working group is established uh, and uh, uh, discussion is ongoing. And ITU also has uh, a long history as a forum uh, of frequency management uh, that uh, spacecraft use. And the rules of allocation of slots in uh, GEO are still working. And Japanese government has been uh, actively participating in the discussion on the rules and norms for space activities at these fora. Uh, JAXA has been supporting uh, Japanese government through uh, dispatching the space experts. Uh, as for uh, COPIOS, Japanese, uh, Japanese diplomat chaired the ad hoc committee of UN COPIOS. And uh, also recently, uh, experts from JAXA and the uh, experts from JAXA and the university uh, chaired uh, COPIOS and its subcommittees. Uh, as current uh, contribution, Japanese uh, government supports the uh, USA's uh, Space Law for New Space Actors project. Mm. 
and the uh, experts from JAXA and the university deliver the uh, lectures. Professor uh, is a uh, secretariat to the uh, unit copious. Okay. And uh, in addition to uh, COPIOS and ITU, uh, there are multiple fora to discuss the international rules and the norms for space activities, as Chris uh, explained. IADC, uh, such as uh, IADC and ISO and CONHAS. And um, regarding uh, security space, uh, the uh, United Nations the first committee and the conference on this armament uh, are major fora to discuss arms control and this armament in uh, space. Uh, recently, they have uh, important progress in the uh, security uh, area discussion. Uh, in 2020, uh, the General Assembly adopted a resolution on reducing uh, space threats through norms, rules, and the principles of uh, responsible behaviors. This is an important achievement for both uh, of, uh, security and uh, civil space activities. Um, each international forum uh, has uh, roles and scope respectively, and uh, participants vary. Uh, I think um, it is okay to have a discussion in a multiple fora regarding the common uh, challenge for humankind. Even if there are uh, overlaps of discussion, uh, there can be uh, gaps of rules and uh, or uh, norms. That is uh, current space activity. And uh, current sp space activities are activated by uh, emerging space faring nation uh, and uh, emerging uh, new space companies. And at the same time, various challenges arise in accordance with the diversity of actors and activities. Uh, this gave a motivation for Japanese government to formulate uh, orbit servicing guidelines uh, during the negotiation of and uh, sign on to the uh, Artemis Accords, Enact Space Resources Act, and the Draft uh, Collision Avoidance Guidelines. Uh, these are uh, kind of uh, local rules. Uh, however, uh, they are intended to uh, be different uh, for the international uh, rules through uh, sharing values of uh, safety and transparency as basic principles. Uh, in my personal view, uh, this is an uh, adaptive governance approach in the broad sense. Uh, this April, uh, International Conference on Space Resources was held at the uh, Liga Subcommittee of COPIOS. Uh, uh, there, uh, a panelist figured out that the uh, importance of the um, bilateral and regional uh, agreements as a basis of international rule. Uh, I hope I ha uh, we have more like-minded uh, people and uh, discuss more. That's uh, Great. my view. Thank you. And so if you guys were like taking notes on that, what I would take is, it sounds like a lot of institutions, a lot of fora, a lot of organizations, and a lot of different initiatives. So a, a lot of multi uh, polycentricity and mul multiple approaches. So now I want to move on to Malaysia, to my friend, Ms. Asalam, Mr. Asalam, similar question. Uh, please tell us the approach that Malaysia is taking towards international governance of space activities and international for COPUS, ITU, et cetera. And, and just to make it more difficult, Malaysia has recently passed a national space law in 2022. Tell us a bit about the impetus for that. Why did you do it? And is it part of a larger effort to engage in space and space governance? The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, uh, as uh, Malaysia is a non-alignment uh, movement country, so it is very important uh, for Malaysia to bring a voice of moderates into the United Nations uh, Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. So, so when Malaysia uh, became members of UN Kupos in 1994, the space agency is not setting up yet. Mm. So we become a members of Kupos because we are very active in astronomy at that time. Um, if I may, uh, going back in history, uh, they are a little bit uh, unique about Malaysia because we start with space program without policy and without act. We, we start with uh, launching our first micro satellite uh, in 2001 and then uh, several uh, communication satellite uh, from 1995 to 1998. We launched uh, our ground station and AIT facilities in 2000 and our astronauts program in 2007. 
And with that all the experience, then we start uh, notice that we can use that experience to develop a, a space policy, which we refer to international activities. So um, the second point, uh, uh, how Malaysia posture to UN Kupos is that uh, because uh, we are uh, uh, imaging space countries, so we can bring fresh ideas. For example, uh, we have a unique problem in the equator, maybe same with other countries uh, in the equator or developing countries. So we bring that uh, ideas and with the help of UN COPOS, so we can have a tailored solution. Mm for the developing countries. So that, that, that is how we posture uh, UN COPOS, which is a, a good platform for uh, emerging countries to start with. And for the second motivation uh, for Malaysia to uh, active in UN COPOS, because we would like to contribute and to make sure that our space is safety and space is not using for uh, a weapon or uh, put anything that can contaminate space. So uh, in uh, that reason, why in 2022, uh, after we have 12 satellites, we come with a Malaysian Space Board Act in 2022 with the spirit to govern uh, space activity in Malaysia. And in our act stated clearly that it prohibits uh, to install any military or uh, a, a weapon in space. So in in very direct direct way, we are, uh, support uh, the activities that conduct by the uh, Paros, for example. Mm. So we think that if the emerging country would like to talk about peaceful use of outer space, then you go to Kupos. And if you want to make sure that space is free of conflict, uh, not using uh, for military, then you have another uh, platform which is um, uh, Paros or the Conference of Disarmament. So, so we using all the, the United Nations uh, platform for us to advance uh, in uh, space activities. Interesting. That's very savvy. I I was paying attention that he's stressing that non-aligned movement and different values when they approach space, including like the peaceful uses and really stressing the peaceful uses. So thank you for that. We may have to return to that. Next, I'm going to go to Mr. Neri. Uh, looking at the international framework, do you see the impact of international space law on commercial actors? For example, how does Canada impose its international obligations under international space law on you as a private actor? The floor is yours. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, well, international space law is definitely impacting private companies, uh, especially spa l satellite operators like Telesat, because they represent the regulatory framework on which you build your own business. So from a private company perspective, what you want is a stable and clear regulatory framework that you can work on. You asked about the impact on international space law. My answer is it depends. Let's take a few examples. For example, if you if you consider the Outer, Outer Space Treaty, uh, that is a very well-tested platform uh, where countries know how to comply with the Outer Space Treaty and how to uh, transfer their obligations onto, for example, satellite operators. So that international space law is not a problem as far as I know. It has never been a problem for anyone. Uh, there is also another international space law that satellite operators use, is the, uh, the radio regulations of the International Telecommunications Union. It's a UN treaty. And also in that case, compliance with the radio regulations is quite clear. And not only compliance with the radio regulations is not an issue for a satellite operator, but it's not even an issue to participate in the evolving process of the radio regulations because there is a very well structured process which is see every four years a world radio communications conference that updates radio regulations. Where the problem is sometimes, and uh, I see it more and more often, is when there are national uh, initiatives to build rules, for example, 
uh, on space sustainability, where there is no harmonization. That is, if you measure the impact on the difficulty or the reduction in uh, uh, certainty on the international regulatory framework, that is where satellite operators uh, suffered the most, in my view, because if you are like Telesat mm, uh, mm, deploying, for example, a low Earth orbit constellation, you don't know which standards or which rules you need to comply with because you can see different initiatives to uh, going towards path that sometimes are diverging over the same topic. All right. And you asked about Canada, how Canada is in. Uh, regulating us uh, with respect to um, uh, compliance with the international, space, uh, international law. That is quite simple in Canada. For example, uh, you basically are licensed to use certain frequencies, uh, so-called ITU filing, and over there, in the license that you receive, you also have some obligations about space sustainability. So that is a quite clear process. Thank you for that. Um, before we move on to the second round of questions, a small bit of housekeeping on the Whova app. You can both answer the poll, and w near the end of the panel, we're going to close the poll, and maybe if we need to, if it's interesting, get some reactions from our panelists. And also, submit some questions. Um, we'll take a look at them and, and see if our panelists want to respond to them. Uh, Ruth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Fyros, if I could come back to you. Um, as such a long-standing member of Kopuos. I think Malaysia has a lot to offer. I know there is a discussion now among private industry that they might like more um, participation in Kopuos. The ITU is set up to have a strong um, industry participation, even though in the end it is the nations that vote. Kopuos is set up differently um, and certainly um, nations may ask their industry uh, before they go to the meetings, but more recently there has been um, um, a discussion. <laughs> is, is it fit for purpose, is the term the Brits, I think, mm. would use. Is the structure of Copos helpful to nations today, considering the kinds of, of questions you're facing, and, and if not, can you think of something you might like to change, or do you think it's really working well? Uh, yes, um, oh. I think that. Koichi san, sit oh, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I will <laughs> ask you the same <laughs> question, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think um, the um, uh, multi, uh, multi uh, sector, uh, multi um, uh, stakeholder discussion is very mm. important for uh, uh, to. Uh, Rule making and uh, long building for space activities, mm -hmm. especially for the emerging space uh, activities. So now um, at the uh, COPIOS, the, uh, the um, uh, more participants from uh, industry I, I is uh, we have. So uh, a little bit changing. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I want to uh, s see the change is uh, a good thing for uh, yeah, COPIOS. Uh, so that they uh, uh, functioning at, uh, continue to be functioning at the uh, forum to uh, discuss the international uh, norms for space activities. Mm -hmm. That's my view. Mm -hmm. And 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 uh, just before we turn to 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 Ferris again, does Japan use experts from its industry? to help it come to decisions for Copuos? Uh, for the, uh, the uh, some events, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, industry uh, people are, are joining, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. And, and Feroz, tell us what you think about the system. Uh, the United Nations uh, systems from the beginning is only involve states then whatever, whether when we have coupons, then the same systems continue. But we must remember that uh, in 1958, there are uh, only 18 members and with two superpowers, and all space activities is conducted by the government. Nowadays, the landscape is different. Uh, privates brings more uh, happiness, more <laughs> 
unix and uh, <laughs> more funding for example in in uh, malaysia in our policy we stated that in 2030 malaysia the space should contribute 1% equivalence to like uh, 1 billion us dollar to the economics the government cannot do that the private entities is the 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 power to do that so my personal opinion is that uh, with the current situation uh, the committee the un cupos must think something pragmatic how we can bring the voice of industry and private entities uh, uh, and uh, however the the final decision is still made by cupos but there must be a channel how the private entities uh, can uh, uh, link up uh, can bring their voice and opinions i don't know how but i think they must create a channel uh, and the final decision is still with cupos but there must be a special channel uh, i i'm not sure how but uh, i think uh, that issues is already discussed uh, in cupos in malaysia before we go for uh, LAC or scientific we have a meeting with masik malaysia space industry corporation okay and with the academia because mm. there are 14 item in the LAC for example space traffic management space debris definition so we we request we ask and we debate with the industry and sometimes it's very difficult yeah because uh, industry have their own perspective the government of security and have their own perspective however as a country we need to bring uh, the ideas the new uh, suggestion so uh, for me yes you and cupos uh, must think how to to bring the voice from the industry i think what happened right now uh, maybe uh, the industry give the input to the state members however they they don't have the solid voice Thank you. Thank you. And Mario, just before I ask you for sort of the opposite views, how does industry feel? Something I wonder, um, you know, Malaysia, Japan, you can turn to your own industry to ask its advice before you go to Kopuos. But does Malaysia have access to the Canadian experts, the Japanese experts? I think this may be um something that the ITU does well with its study groups all of the nations are in the working parties in the study groups they hear the experts from all of the countries and then they go home and think what's best for their country but perhaps the copuo system right now is a little divided where malaysia you only hear your experts before you go to the meeting and so I'm just it's just occurring to me that that might be a system that needs to be tweaked a little. So, Mario, <coughs> yeah, a private company represented by Canada, one particular country, but obviously you have global services. So, from your sort of opposite position, how do you feel this system is working? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. That is um I one of the strengths of the ITU system as you were saying is its how its membership is structured in the study groups so in the work between one world radio conference and the other everyone is on the same level playing field if you put a study on the 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 table to be discussed it has the same value or the same importance if there is any importance associated to it to a study put forward by uh, a member state mm -hmm. does it matter um i think so because um the industry as its uh, as the expertise do you like formula 1 i think or <coughs> but, I, know, uh, i know what it is <laughs> <laughs> so you know in formula 1 between one season and the other the chief engineer of a racing team has the opportunity to update its car you know what is the uh the, the the advice the chief engineer is seeking the most it's the advice of the pilot mm -hmm. so this is the same problem of course on the regulatory uh, on the regulatory sphere member states that are the chief engineer of policy regulations should listen to the pilot 
uh, even if they are sitting on the, in different countries, because it's that feedback, mm -hmm. it's that our private R&D and private thoughts that can inform uh, their, their views and on, uh, in turn, the member states, countries can leverage on the expertise and on the resources that the private industry has at its disposal. But continuing your Formula One analogy, should the driver of, you know, should the chief engineer of, um, I don't know, we'll, we'll call it Porsche's team? I'm so bad. I'm so <laughs> Ferrari, bad. Ferrari. <laughs> Ferrari, all right. Should the, should the chief engineer of Ferrari also have access to the advice from the driver of the Maserati team? Well, uh, that's kind of my question for these nations is, do they feel they're getting the range of advice that might be most useful? I don't think it's the case in Copos. Okay. Uh, and I believe that listening to the different uh, views of the industry, wherever their headquarters are, uh, it's very, very important. Yeah. And then in the end, uh, for modifying a UN treaty, it are the, it's the member states making the decision, but at least they can leverage on the, on the studies and on the feedback they receive from the industry, wherever the yeah. industry is. As you were saying, all these, a lot of these space systems, the space services, especially in the te on the telecommunication side, are global by definition. So why do you want to listen only to the voices coming from a country rather than another? Yeah, yeah. All right, so we've gotten a number of interesting questions from the audience. I see a very interesting one from Federico de Bruno. I also saw one from Ryan Guglietto. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna talk about this, that one um, about, uh, well, talking about COPUS and talking about when, when we think about international fora, you know, many of the, it's kind of negotiated beforehand. Many of the remarks and statements are drafted before you go to COPUS. So, Say from Malaysia, you draft the statement you're going to make under a, one, of the, uh, one of the items, maybe beforehand. You go there and you make your statement. And then another state makes their statement. Uh, do you find that that uh, leads to like a, a, a rich dialogue or is it just kind of pre-prepared remarks? And no matter your answer, how, how, can, how do you think we can improve something like that? Uh, there is the challenge uh, in uh, Kupos right now. I think we've done 102 countries members in Kupos. Uh, if the structure of the meeting is not changed, and then most of the time we will hear the uh, country update on their activities. So uh, that uh, make the consequences that there are not enough time uh, to discuss about the current or immediate issues. For example, to discuss about uh, how to link up uh, space debris with the STMs. Um, so the best, uh, the alternative is uh, because the numbers of the member state is increased from 18 in the beginning until 102. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, and the meeting is too long. It's like two weeks uh, uh, meetings and and two days are uh, allocated for the reports. Yeah. So that, that for, for me is uh, too long. And how the, the, the coupons make a decision is by uh, consensus. And with the current tension of geopolitics, for example, and with the UN uh, uh, style in consensus, it's very difficult nowadays uh, to get immediate uh, decision and to move forward. And this is uh, what happened in the last LAC. For the first time, uh, the meeting uh, cannot ad adopt it because uh, one country uh, not agreed with uh, the meeting. So um, this is the time uh, for the uh, UN COPOS, uh, UN USA, to have a look because the, the numbers, the member state is increasing and uh, and the same time we also uh, would like to hear the the uh, opinion from the uh, private so it's a time uh, for the uh, for the country state for the uh, coupons to have uh, a re-look re on the mechanism of the coupons meeting 
Great, I, and I hope maybe you guys would want to respond to that too. It's it's about making these international fora more um, active, more of a dialogue, and more reflective. And let, let's say slightly aligned to that is, you know, informing international fora about about space sustainability issues, about whether it's dark and quiet skies or space debris remediation. What do you think? And this is you know getting back, I guess, to what Ruth was also asking. Like, what are your um, interactions or impressions of how do we make these international fora? you know, responsive and aligned to current pr and emerging issues right around the corner, like dark and quiet skies? Uh, yeah, uh, I think um, uh, it is uh, difficult to, uh, for the international uh, rules and norms to catch up the development of technology. So um, I think the, um, the uh, kind of local rule uh, is uh, in, uh, is imp uh, getting important. Uh, for example, uh, Japan, uh, Japanese government formulated the uh, orbit servicing guidelines uh, in 2021. Uh, since the uh, guidelines uh, uh, for orbit servicing were not included in the LTS guidelines, uh, the reason is the uh, the, the some country, uh, some states uh, pointed out that uh, technology is not mature. Mm. There, uh, but uh, uh, we have uh, um, the uh, actual operator for uh, to engage, uh, which, which are engaging in uh, orbit servicing, including active debris removal. So uh, Japanese government uh, had to um, the uh, rules for the, uh, their mission uh, uh, because the, um, the Article 6 of uh, Outer Space Treaty uh, provides that uh, uh, the states uh, are responsible for uh, its national uh, space activity and uh, non-governmental entities' activity requires uh, authorization and the continuing uh, supervision. Uh, by appropriate state. So uh, the um, so the that guideline is uh, local rule, but uh, it's uh, uh, expected to be a reference for uh, the uh, international rule. Great. So the, uh, I uh, expect uh, uh, the copios uh, is uh, uh, is expected to be the. A forum to exchange uh, the information, the uh, uh, good practice, and uh, uh, read the uh, development international rules and norms. Thank you. Um, in the few minutes that we have left, I think we should close the poll and maybe if we can put up the poll results on the screen to see if there's any reactions from it. Um, but while we do that, I do want to see if there's any very quick takes on from all of you. This final question, what topics need to be addressed at the international level? So which, and this plays into our next couple panels, what needs to be addressed internationally and what do you think is best suited for just national discussions? If you have any reactions or any strong feelings on that, please, please go ahead. Maybe I yeah, first. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, the issue on uh, space debris uh, currently is, is looked separately between uh, there are agenda on space debris, there are agenda on space traffic management, there are discussion in legal subcommittee, there are discussion in uh, scientific uh, subcommittee, and there are also agenda on small satellite. So I believe that the best way these three items, uh, mega constellation uh, that maybe cause uh, space debris and therefore we need space traffic management, need to be uh, uh, d uh, discussed in uh, one package, not uh, separately. And um, how the coupons uh, working is, uh, normally uh, we will, uh, the coupons will produce a guideline if there are working groups. But right now the, there are no uh, working group that compose these three agenda. So, uh, so I think it's, it's uh, good to have package these three item uh, and uh, do it in the format of working group in UN Coupos and finally come with a solution. Uh, what is should discussed in international and local? 
all these three issues should bring to the national agenda and discuss and to make uh, your uh, uh, our uh, space activities is uh, lawful and uh, uh, full, uh, follow the international regulation. All right. Um, if you can make it quick, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, in my view, are all the the issues that needs to be harmonized. And then I give you an example. For example, it would be great if there were a process in which you could ar harmonize harmonize the rules of the road on how you fly a satellite. For example, today, if you are a satellite operator, you receive a collision avoidance message. Uh, what you basically can do is to try to coordinate any possible maneuver with the other object, if the object can be maneuvered, and uh, this is left to the willingness to the parties involved. But there are no clear rules on who should move first, what is the level of covariance that needs to be uh, ensured, or what is the le threshold of probability of collision before a maneuver needs to take place. So this is a, c a clear example in which these kind of rules should be standardized and developed in an international framework because there are different actors from different countries that need to talk to each other. All right, thank you for that. I think that was pretty authoritative. Um, let's have a round of applause for my first set of panelists. <laughs>